let me introduce you to the last speaker for today. Linda Rising um, is going to close our event. She has a PhD from Arizona State University in the field of object-based design metrics and a background that includes university teaching and industry work in telecommunications, avionics, and strategic weapon systems. Oh my, she will be busting myths around organizational change. And with that, I yield to Linda. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Let me check to make sure, can you hear me? Can you see me? Good, okay. So on the very first slide, there is my contact information. I hope we will have time for questions, but if not, please send email, ask any questions about this presentation or anything else you might find on YouTube. We can also connect on LinkedIn. I know that we're all looking for connection these days. I wanna start with appreciation for the organizers of this conference who have brought us together and also thank you for your time. I know that you are so weary of online contact. I'm hoping that we can all be back together soon. This is about patterns. I'm sure you're all familiar with patterns you might not realize or think about how powerful patterns are. And the reason for that power is in the name. What someone has with a pattern is a name for a problem in a particular context with a solution that works. And once you have a collection of those names, then you have, well, something like a language a language made up of names, and you can talk about any domain, whether it's organizational change or user interface design or customer interaction, a pattern language gives you a way to talk about that domain without using a lot of explanation, just the names. So there will be names of patterns throughout this presentation. Names come from two books that I have written with my good friend, Mary Lynn Manns. And when I started writing the very first one, Fearless Change, I was, as you heard from the introduction, a technical person. That is, my PhD was in computer science. I had spent my entire career working in technical fields. I thought the answers to problems I had were all technical. And what I've had to learn through the writing of these two books was a lot of other information that I did not know. Psychology, social psychology. Social psychology is the study of groups. I knew a little bit about psychology, but absolutely nothing about social psychology. Influence, I now teach a course on influence, but at the time I thought influence was for, well, salespeople, marketing, business people, not anything I had to worry about as a technical person. It was a big leap for me to all of a sudden realize all my technical education was not going to help me make change. I had to learn something about other disciplines. And then finally, evolutionary biology, that what we know now about how we think and how our brains work is something that began tens of thousands of years ago when we were a beginning species, when we were living in the Stone Age. Our brains have not evolved much since that time. And there isn't any way we can change that. It's hardwired. That means it meant survival. 
So we need to understand all of these disciplines, not just the technical ones, in order to understand how to make change. Well, this is a series of myths. A myth is something we all believe, but it isn't true. So my first example is smart people are rational. This is an unfortunate belief because we not only believe it about other people, we believe it about ourselves. We think we're smart, so therefore we are logical. We believe that we look at facts, that we are interested in evidence in proof, when in reality, the evidence is that we are not. No matter how smart we are, we are not rational. And by rational, I've actually put a definition on this slide. What I mean is rational in the economic sense, that we will always move to make decisions that are in our best interests. We will not go against our own interests. That's rational. I don't know how many of you have read this book. If I could see you, I would ask you to raise your hands. How many of you have heard of Thinking Fast and Slow? How many of you were interested enough to go out and buy it? How many of you read well, the first chapter, how many of you made it through more than one chapter? How many of you read the whole book? Well, what we find is that, you know, with the exception of a few people out there, most have not. It's a difficult book. It's a book about science. It's a book about evidence. It's a book about the work of Daniel Kahneman, who received a Nobel Prize, and his good partner, Amos Tversky. It's very well written. It's actually easy to understand. It just takes a lot of attention, concentration. I know you have time to read, so I'm going to recommend it. And if you don't want to put in the energy, then I suggest you go to YouTube and search on Thinking Fast and Slow, Linda Rising, and you'll find a couple of talks I've given about the book that will help you understand the evidence. The research shows that far from being rational, we have a set of predictably irrational decision-making techniques that we use. They're called cognitive biases. If you don't have the stamina to read Thinking Fast and Slow, then any book by Dan Ariely will also help you understand this area of research. His book is called Predictably Irrational, but any book by Dan Ariely is awesome. I recommend it. These two scientists have created a brand new field. It's called behavioral economics. And the founding assumption is that we, that people, are not rational. We do not make rational decisions. We're not logical decision makers at all. Science has evidence for this. So what are we going to do instead? In the beginning, when we are starting to do organizational change or influence other people, we don't often have proof for our ideas. In fact, many times I'm talking to people who are doing agile development, and I will ask them, do you have any proof? Do you have any evidence? Have you looked at all the randomized, controlled, double-blind experiments that show that Agile or your idea are really, truly better than what you are doing now? Or is it the case that you just believe it? 
you have faith in it. That's very different. And in fact, if you don't believe in it, if you don't have faith in it, you're not going to be successful in convincing other people. So it's not a bad thing to have belief. It's a requirement. Ultimately, you want proof, but in the beginning, you don't have it. The pattern is called evangelist. And it means, well, religion. You believe. You have no proof. But it's a requirement. Become an evangelist. If you're going to change other people, the very first person you have to convince is yourself. And then, since you have no proof, you must begin some small, very small experiments. Go through this little cycle over and over. Just do some small thing. Just do it. Try it out. And then stop and think about it. Take time for reflection and look at what worked in your little experiment. Build on the things that worked. Find out what worked for you. And then take the next very tiny baby step and repeat. And do this over and over and over. And in fact, it never ends. This is how you should move forward, not only in organizational change. This is how you learn. This is how you learn to walk. This is how you learn to talk. This is really how you have learned anything that stayed with you. If you play a musical instrument or a sport or learn a new programming language, it doesn't matter. Your brain goes through this little cycle. Try something. Is it working? Build on your success. Take the next baby step. Repeat over and over again. What we know is that facts are not convincing. It's good to have evidence, of course. But if you begin to talk about facts, then people who listen to you will immediately Begin to analyze and attack. Find what's wrong with your logic. The way to convince people or the way to influence people is not to use facts, but to use stories. Tell a good story. And in fact, those scientists who have looked at how your brain works, have discovered that when someone presents facts to you, you begin to push back or resist. Whereas when someone tells you a good story, you begin to move with them. Your brains actually sync up. You stay with the storyteller instead of resisting or attacking. And very different areas of the brain are involved. You're more open to hearing a good story. Facts, you tend to close down and resist. The pattern in fearless change is called emotional connection. You want people to feel what you feel. You want people to believe what you believe. Tell them a good story. We know that all organizations are what are called complex adaptive systems. And the only way you can change a complex adaptive system is by doing the steps probe, sense, and respond. Those are exactly the steps in the iteration cycle we just covered. Probe, try something. Sense. Look at what happened and then respond using very tiny baby steps. Of course, most of us want to make a big plan and we think it's going to happen by some end date. 
in reality, organizational change or change in you, you are an org, a complex adaptive system as well. All change is something about learning and taking small steps. A lot of agile development is based on this premise, small deliveries, taking small steps in an experiment, learning as you go. Myth number two, uh, it's the belief in goodness. Our ideas are so good. Surely, because they are so good, well, they must ultimately win. Isn't that how the world works? This is one of those cognitive biases I mentioned earlier. The belief in goodness. So I'm just going to ask you to take a minute. Can you think of a time in history? It doesn't matter what idea it is, technical idea, political idea. When the bad ideas won and triumphed over the good ideas. Yeah, goodness, not enough. I know it doesn't seem like this is a pattern that has anything to do with goodness. It's one of my favorites from Fearless Change, the do food pattern. It says that we are hardwired to be more open and trusting when we share food. In the Stone Age, those were the only people we shared food with. In our small tribes or small groups, we shared food with people we knew. And even today, when we have too much food and we share food with a lot of different people, our brains respond to eating together. So if you use food when you're talking about your idea, when you're trying to influence people or convince them, they are going to be more open. It turns out this technique works when the food is good. It doesn't matter whether the idea is good or not. Plenty of scientific evidence has shown that you can use this technique for bad ideas and it will work. Now, what you do have to be careful about is, is the food good? Is the food something that people really care about? That's what's important. Not the goodness of the idea. That has no impact at all. Scientific experiments have shown that we don't care about the goodness of the idea. But do we care about the food, the goodness of the food? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I gave this talk once in England and Morton Elvang came up and he said, you are talking about something we do in our office. It's called Maria's Rule. Maria bakes wonderful cakes. I asked him to send me a picture of one of them. Maria's rule says there are very few problems that cake cannot solve. Do food. It's very influential and has nothing to do with the quality of the idea. Myth number three. Oh, we all believe this. If I had enough power, I could make people change. If I were the president or the CEO, if I were in charge, it would be so easy. Because I have power, I can make people do what I want. Well, in a way, that's true. If you threaten people, if you say, I will fire you unless you adopt this new practice, that's very effective. If you say, I will kill you if you don't adopt this practice. Yes, yes, that's effective. 
The problem with it is that what you get is something called, in English, compliance. People will do it. They will appear to do it. But underneath that superficial appearance, they continue to do exactly what they have always done. And if you don't watch, if you don't monitor, if you don't pay attention, then they will slowly go back to what they were doing before you threaten them. Compliance is not change. What you want is, in English, we say commitment, that I am going to do it because I also believe. I also have faith. I also think this is a better way. And then my heart will follow. My behavior will change. That's what you want. You don't want compliance. It's short-lived, very ineffective, and it takes overhead. And over time, the overhead only increases. You have to have someone watch others to make sure they're really doing it. And then you have to have people watch the watchers. Pretty soon the overhead is greater than the cost of doing whatever it is in the first place. So power, power gets you nowhere. I don't know if you've read The Seven Habits. If you have, please read it again. If you haven't, put it on your list. Stephen Covey, the author, said, you can buy a person's hand, but you can't buy his heart. His heart is where his enthusiasm, his loyalty is. You can buy his back, but you can't buy his brain. That's where his creativity is, his ingenuity, his resourcefulness. The pattern in fearless change is personal touch. You have to talk to everybody and you have to understand where they're coming from. Every person wants to know, why should I? What's in it for me? And what we know is that people are going to react in a very predictable way to anything new that comes along. You've probably seen this adoption curve. The innovators, the early adopters, the early majority, the late majority, and the laggards. But what you might not know, or maybe no one told you, is that these tendencies are hardwired. Now, individuals might play different roles, but you're always going to get this spectrum. Looks like that. That's the adoption curve you've probably seen. Why would this be hardwired? Let's go back to the Stone Age when we were always hungry sitting in a circle and all of a sudden we notice a couple of our members are missing. I wonder where they are. And then someone sees them coming over the hill and we notice, oh, look, they're carrying some fruit, some berries. What do they have? They're so excited. They say, we have found some new berries just over the hill. We've been eating these berries and they are very good. You should try them. Would that be a good idea for all of us? Every single member of our tribe, would that be a good idea for all of us to just go over the hill and try those berries? These are new, something we've never seen before. Oh, they seem to be very good. Would that be wise? What has kept us alive is that we did not do that. 
Some of us, the early adopters said, well, let me see what happens to these innovators. And maybe tomorrow, if they are still okay, then I might try those berries. The early majority are going to wait until they see a lot of other people eating the berries before they try them. The late majority will not try the berries unless they are starving. Starving to death is not a good way forward. So if there's absolutely nothing else to eat, well, they might try the berries. And of course, the laggards will never, will never eat the berries, even if they are starving. Can you see how this led to survival of our species? Can you see how this is a good response to anything new, even in organizations today? We tend to think that everyone should do the same thing. They should all be alike. They should adopt the new ideas and be enthusiastic. When we have no proof, remember, we have no proof. We are asking organizations to follow us and eat the berries, even though we don't know whether this is the right thing for our organization or not. We believe that it is. We have faith that it is, but we don't know. We should take advantage of this response and let people take ideas on their own schedule in fact, if you want your organization or your team to be successful building on people's responses, let the innovators go ahead, let them find new things. Wonderful. Early adopters, they are gonna question. Yes, good idea. Early majority, they're gonna wait until they see most people doing it. And yes, the laggards, they'll never do it. That's okay. Each one of these groups has something to contribute, and we are never going to all be the same. The idea that we could be all the same is preposterous and dysfunctional. These are roles. Sometimes you're an innovator. Sometimes you're a laggard. We know older people tend to be at the bottom, but not necessarily. Sometimes very young people are laggards. People can change. They can move up over time as they learn, as they see. They can move up that adoption scale. And certainly it would not be a good idea if everyone in your organization were an innovator. Think about it. Myth number four. Oh, those negative people. They must be stupid. I will just ignore them. Pattern and fearless change says you can learn. You can learn from those laggards. You can learn from those resistors. You should treat them with respect and listen. Really listen. Learn what they know. Learn from their experience. Sometimes Listening with respect is a very powerful influencer. Sometimes when you listen with respect, you can overcome a lot of resistance. Sometimes that's all a resistor wants, just to have someone listen, to really listen with respect. We know that the way you treat people when you listen changes them. A very famous experiment had men talking to women. And when they said, you're talking to a beautiful woman, it changed the way they communicated. It changed the way the women responded to them. We know that if you treat others with respect, they feel that. They know that. And that changes how they communicate with you. It's a feedback cycle. We pick up on these signals 
And in fact, now there's research that shows those signals can be measured. We know when someone is listening, really listening, and when they are not. Stephen Covey said, seek first to understand, then be understood. You can also take advantage of a resistor by saying, we need somebody who is a devil's advocate. You should always have this role. Every team, every discussion, every decision should have someone who asks hard questions. If everyone agrees, if no one questions, if no one looks at all sides, then your team, your organization is headed for the cliff and no one will say, wait a minute, should we be running off this cliff? Hold it. Let's think about this. Myth number five, you're smart. It's your idea. Why should you involve other people? You want to get credit for this. After all, you've worked hard on it. Pattern in fearless change is ask for help. The most influential thing you can do for others is to say, I can't do this by myself. I need you to help me. Otherwise, the idea is all about you. And once you've done that, be sure to say thanks. We know this is a good idea, but now we can say there's research. There's research that says thanking, appreciating is good. And here's how you do it. Make sure it's sincere. Make sure it's timely. Describe what happened and the impact. As an example, Thanks for working late last night. You fixed that bug. Now we can do the customer demo on time. There's so many benefits. This is the one of the most powerful patterns in the collection. We know that people who take time to appreciate others. And in fact, I'm going to recommend this for you in this difficult period we are in is to be grateful, to be thankful for what you have, thankful for what interaction you do have. Isn't it wonderful that we have technology that will allow us to communicate? Otherwise, in a lockdown, we really would be isolated. We really would have no contact at all. We know that giving appreciation is most powerful thing we can do. So that's how I'm going to close. Thank you again. I really appreciate your being here. I feel that it would be better if we could all be together. But in the meantime, this technological link is so powerful. I am grateful. So I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you so much. Thank you for this insightful talk. I, I really feel like this was the crown jewel of today. And, and um, we really had some great feedback, which I would like to start by, because you couldn't see the, the real-time feedback. People are just taken away by your presentation. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. I also want to say someone mentioned that they would go to the Church of Linda Rising. So perhaps you can, you know, start uh, start a cult or something like that. Um, but yeah, uh, and a lot of people said that they read uh, Daniel Kahneman's uh, book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And uh, some people even said that they read it because you mentioned it in another presentation. So thank you for uh, creating a better world. Uh, it's a it's a great book. Um, first of all, I I want to make sure something because I am one of those I I think I am one of those early adopters in my life, and um, it just kind of seems like you made the point of it's good that we are not all early adopters, and I sometimes find myself believing that. It's great to have early adopters because we can move fast and be nimble and uh, create change within the organization. So just if you could clarify for me, was that all about accepting everybody taking 
the pace that they are comfortable taking? So I'm going to ask you if you've ever been a laggard or late majority ever in your life? Ever? I, I want to say there is a probability, perhaps, <laughs> probably. I can't think of a, can't think of, can't think of one example right now, but probably. I mean, okay, sure. And it, it depends on, I'm going to use the word comfort, how comfortable or how uncomfortable. And it doesn't have to be a technical thing and, or an organizational thing. Maybe it could be something like food. Have you ever been in a situation where someone said, oh, here's a new food, or maybe uh, the first time you had sushi, or if you've ever traveled to a country where people ate strange things like insects or the eyes of fish or an animal that you thought was distasteful, like a guinea pig or a cat or a dog, and said, here, have some of this food this wonderful food, we enjoy it. It's a specialty here. And you were a laggard. You said, I don't, I don't think I could eat a dog. I don't think I could eat fish eyes. I don't think I could eat raw fish. Has that ever happened? I think I could eat anything. Especially <laughs> once, if there is someone already, you know, like I'm not gonna go pick out berries on my own in a forest, but if someone says, uh -huh. you know, like we okay. eat this, <laughs> <laughs> then, then sure. Okay. Yeah. So there, we all have these tendencies within ourselves and it gets, uh, I would say, more uh, exacerbated as we get older. There are, uh, at the science shows there are windows when we are opening uh, to listening to certain kinds of music, when we eat certain kinds of food, things we like, things we don't like, that we have certain reactions to those. And maybe you're so young that you've never encountered those. That's wonderful. And <laughs> I don't want to encourage you to be a laggard because I think it's good to be open. Um, it is good to be, it is good to be open. But there are, we also want to be careful that if people are uncomfortable for some reason with a change that makes them feel uneasy, that we should listen to that. There's got to be some human reason for their resistance. And instead, what we tend to do in organizations is we denigrate or we make fun of, or we don't listen to people who don't immediately jump on the bandwagon for the latest and greatest. And that means that we're not gonna learn something that might be very valuable that would help us moving forward if we all think in exactly the same way. We're much more likely to make mistakes and run after something without truly thinking about it History is full of examples of people running after some new idea that led them to a very bad place. So what I'm hearing, I have two questions here from two separate attendees. Um, one of them says, what would, you be, what would be your advice on the laggards who block improvement of the organization? after you've tried all the possible experience to get them on board. I feel like there is another question that really connects to this. What tips would you give us to have more innovators and early adopters in the organizations? How could you help people transform in their roles? So the people that we work with all care about what they do. They all care about the organization. And in fact, in the early days of Agile, I heard an Agile thought leader say, if people won't get on board with pair programming, you should fire them. So I believe that if 
someone doesn't want to pair program, we should try to understand why it is that that person is so resistant to pair programming. And we might discover something about the way we're doing pair programming or the way we're implementing it in our organization. We would learn something about how to improve that so that this person would feel more comfortable with it. But if we find that this person is resisting just for the sake of resistance, and if this person really doesn't care then that means you should question whether or not that person should stay as a part of the organization. It can happen that someone is not contributing, is not learning, does not care, and that means now we need to have a conversation that maybe this organization is not the best place for you if you really don't care, if you really don't want to learn, if you really don't want to move forward, then maybe it's time for you to be happier somewhere else. Yes, of course, that can happen. But our immediate reaction is to say, oh, they must be bad people. They must be stupid people. And we don't take the time to really learn. Maybe they can teach us something. Maybe we can learn how to make this better especially since we have no proof. The best example I can think of right now is the tendency of agile organizations to use the open office. Of course, we're all at home now, so this debate has gone away. But in organizations in the past where I would have gone in and they would say, look, Linda, we just made this beautiful open office space. Well, the evidence is clear open offices do not get you any benefits. In fact, they work against you. And we are not paying attention. We're not listening to the evidence because we believe that this is the way to go. And we hear so many good stories about it. And we hear other organizations are doing it. So this must be, this must be what we should do. So if you don't pay attention to what people who disagree with you, what if there is evidence, what it shows, then we're going to make a lot of very bad decisions and we will hurt ourselves, our own productivity and our own innovativeness and creativity. But we always got to ask those questions. What else can we do? Who can we talk to? Who can help us learn about this? Thank you. And um, with that said, uh, we are shortly running out of time, but I know you are going to stay with us for a, for a little bit. But I have one more question because the audience loves you so much and I, <laughs> I can totally side with them. Um, and and uh, if you could just give us a story about when you were the evangelist within an organization um, and how that worked out for you, that would be just like Great. So I, I wrote a book about that. It's called The Patterns Handbook. And I didn't know at the time about the pattern evangelist. I just knew that I loved patterns. I had bought the book Design Patterns at a big conference called Uppsala. And I was so enthusiastic about those patterns. I came back and started talking to my team and I said, you know, I, I think maybe we could get together over lunch and I could cover two or three of these patterns over lunchtime and you could see whether you like them or not and maybe you could try the patterns as well. And as I look back on that, I realize I was an evangelist. I wasn't providing any food, but we were all eating together over lunch. I was always saying, you could just try it. I wasn't telling them this is the way. I was offering it as an experiment, which is a pattern, it's called trial run. I never made them feel bad that they didn't get to go to the conference, that they didn't know about it. I always said, what do you think? 
do you think these are good ideas? I like them, but I don't know everything. I was asking for their opinion, listening to what they had to say, really being open to any criticism they had of the pattern saying, ah, you could be right about that. And that's how all the patterns started was from that experience. And the book that I wrote about it is called The Patterns Handbook. And it's really the story of what I did by accident. I was just lucky that turned around an entire organization just by going to a conference and bringing back a very important book, the Gang of Four book, the Design Patterns book. It changed that organization, it changed my life. Wow, thank you so much. Um, with that said, um, I want to show you what we have here for you. Um, just a little keepsake for um, the stretch conference. Um, so you can remember us uh, for, uh, for the morning coffees. Um, <laughs> thank you for joining us.